Hi, this is Chris. Now that I've covered how to round both normal and subnormal numbers, it's time to update the FPMO module to support rounding. This will bring us closer to having a completed floating point multiplication circuit. In order to perform rounding, there has to be a means for the user to specify which rounding attribute is desired. This leads to the new input value RA. The rounding module also reports whether or not the result of the rounding operation triggers an inexact exception. The IEEE 754 standard calls out five different exceptions which must be detected and reported. For that reason, I've also added the bit vector exception to the argument list for the FPMO module. As we've seen in previous videos, in addition to the rounding attribute, the rounding module requires the sign of the number being rounded, its exponent, and its significant. I covered how the sign of the product is computed in a previous video, so I won't be discussing its derivation here. I simply want to note that we already have the value available for our use. The rounding module outputs the exponent and significant for the rounded results and the inexact flag. I'm not going to talk about the inexact flag since I've already covered its function in a previous video. Here, highlighted in blue, you can see the definitions for these three return values. Also, I want to note again that I've applied the advice from all my circuits about how to incorporate NSIG dependent hand optimized multipliers. You can see what that looks like on this slide. Please note that I have tested every possible combination of inputs for the NSIG values 10 and 23, that is for the binary 16 and binary 32 floating point formats, so I am reasonably confident that they are correct and robust. I have done some limited testing of the significant multiplier code for the binary 64 and binary 128 floating point formats but my advice before you choose to trust them is caveat emptor. Much of the logic for what is going to happen in the remainder of the video was discussed in an earlier video, so I won't be justifying my assumptions here. I will simply cite my assumptions and use them to explain the changes to the code. Since the code is now signaling exceptions, in the case that one or both of our operands is a signaling NAN, we need to signal the invalid exception. We also need to signal the invalid exception if we're trying to multiply infinity times zero. The next change is how I deal with subnormal numbers. Because the previous version of the code simply truncated the product significant to at most n sig plus one bits, and because the smallest representable exponent for subnormal numbers is e min minus n sig, I knew in advance that when two subnormal numbers were multiplied together, that the exponent of the product would be smaller than e min minus n sig, so there was never any reason to actually perform the multiplication. Because of the round toward positive and round toward negative rounding attributes, I can no longer simply zero out the product of two subnormal numbers. You can see the change in the conditional logic in this slide. The next two changes happen in tandem. When the two significants are multiplied, we know that at least one of the two most significant bits will be one. Previously, I found the most significant one bit in the product, then extracted it and the nsig bits to its right. In the case that the most significant bit of the raw significant product was 1, I showed that the significant needed to be renormalized, which meant that the exponent for the product needed to be incremented by 1. To implement rounding, I need to preserve all significant bits of the raw significant product. But in the new code, I may also need to left shift the significant product because the rounding module expects the most significant bit of the input significant is set to 1. Here you can see the left shift occurs when the most significant bit of the raw significant product is 0. I also use the most significant bit of the raw product to determine if the exponent of the product needs to be incremented. You can see for yourself how much more compact the logic is. Too bad I didn't think of this earlier. 
In the old code, we now had our final value for the exponent and the significand of the product, and we were able to use these values to construct the final product. Here the new code is less clear. Logically, in the new code, control leaves the always block at this point and passes to the rounding module. The exponent and significand values, as we've computed them thus far, enter the rounding module. The outputs of the rounding module are passed back into the always block and into the conditional logic block used to construct the final product value. We need to look at the old version of the conditional logic which constructed the product. If the exponent was less than the smallest possible subnormal exponent, the old code constructs a signed zero value. In the old code, if the exponent falls within the valid range of subnormal numbers, then we constructed the result as a subnormal number. In this slide, I've rewritten the way a zero value is constructed, creating the exponent and significand fields separately. Now we can see that the sign and exponent fields for zeros and subnormal numbers are exactly the same. In the old code, only the way we created the significant field differed in these two cases. In the previous video, I didn't emphasize the point, but because of the way the rounding module works, the new code doesn't need to perform a left shift of the rounded significant value for subnormal numbers as was needed in the old code illustrated here. The properly aligned subnormal significand value exists in the nsig most significant bits of the rounded significand value. So we can construct our subnormal value using these bits. Likewise, if we rounded the significand value to zero, we can also get that information from the same nsig most significant bits of the rounded significand. This means that the case where we round to zero and the case where the product is a subnormal number can now be implemented as a single case. Some of you are already screaming at your computer screens because even though we can construct the product value the same way for these two cases, we need to compute the PFLAGS values differently. The new code determines if any of the bits in the significand field are non-zero. If so, the PFLAGS subnormal field gets set to true. If all of the bits of the significand field are zero, then the PFLAG zero field gets set to true. This is another efficiency improvement over the old non-rounding version of the multiply circuit. That's the good news. The bad news is I didn't realize that this optimization was possible until after I published my last video. The next piece of bad news is that because I changed the rounding module after publishing the previous video, the computation of EXP out in the old video is now incorrect. This is the code which was presented in the previous video. And this is how the new version of the rounding module returns both the EXP out and SIG out values. Now back to the multi-branch if statement we used to construct the product value. We still need to do one more thing for this case. We need to signal that an underflow exception has occurred. This is required when the exponent is less than e min, as is the case here. The next clause in the multi-branch if statement dealt with the case when the product can no longer be represented as a finite number. This happens when the exponent is greater than e max. You can see the old code on screen now. We can no longer just construct plus or minus infinity and be done. Rounding impacts what value we need to return. Per the IEEE spec, when the rounding mode is round ties to even, we always construct either positive or negative infinity, just like the old code. The changes begin with the next part of the spec. If the user has selected round towards zero, we need to construct the largest finite number and use the sign of the intermediate result. For this case, we will never construct either positive or negative infinity. For the round toward negative rounding mode, if the product is positive, we construct the largest finite number. If the product is negative, we construct negative infinity. And finally, for round toward positive, we do the reverse. Positive products become positive infinity and negative products become the largest finite value with a negative sign. 
Before adding the logic to do this, let's compare how infinite values are constructed versus the way the largest finite number is constructed. To simplify, I'll use the binary 16 format. For the moment, I'm ignoring the sign of the product so we can focus on the exponent and significant fields. The largest possible finite exponent is Emacs plus bias. For the binary 16 format, this is 30. Writing 30 as a binary number, we get 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. This makes the exponent as large as possible. To make the significant as large as possible, we set all the bits to 1. This is what the largest finite number looks like. And this is what the value representing infinity looks like. The four most significant bits of the exponent are the same. The least significant bit of the exponent is different, and the significant is different. Notice one more thing. When the least significant bit of the exponent is 0, the bits of the significant are 1, and vice versa. So if we correctly calculate the bit values for the significant, we can compute the least significant bit of the exponent by inverting the value. 1 becomes 0, and 0 becomes 1. I've created a 1-bit value, SI, which is the value we're going to compute for the significant bits. When will SI be 1? If the rounding attribute is round towards 0, then the significant will be all 1's. Likewise, when the rounding attribute is round toward negative and we're rounding a positive result, we need to use the largest finite number, so again, the significant must be all 1's. And finally, when the rounding attribute is round toward positive and the number being rounded is negative, we need the most negative finite number which has a significant of all ones. Back to the code. Note that the least significant bit of the exponent is the not of SI. But we're not done yet. If we're returning an infinite value, we need to mark the appropriate bit in the PFLAG's bit vector. Likewise, if we're returning a finite number, we need to set P flag to indicate that we're returning a normal number. And we need to signal the overflow exception. Some of you are already realizing that the same logic should be applied earlier in the always block when one of the operands is infinity. Yes, the logic should probably be applied there too, but it gives me a certain amount of heartburn to take an infinite value and make it finite. Still, the spec says what the spec says. For the final else clause, the bias value is added to the exponent. The biased exponent and the rounded significant value are used to construct the product return value. There's one final detail. There are multiple paths through the always block. Some of the paths don't use the results of the rounding module. When the always block is entered, all of the exception flags are cleared. This includes the inexact flag. If our two operands were subnormal or normal numbers, we use the rounding module. For the paths which use the rounding module, we need to use the inexact flag returned by the rounding module to set the appropriate bit in the exception vector. For any of the cases where one of the operands was a NAN, an infinity, or a zero, the inexact flag gets left unset. That's it for the changes to the multiply circuit, but before wrapping up, I want to discuss a couple of other details. The first is that I'm questioning whether or not the code ought to be computing the PFLAG's value so that the multiply circuit can report the type of the product back to the higher level logic. For each of the circuits needed to implement a floating point processor, the circuit is going to have to determine the type of the data being processed, and for normal and subnormal numbers, the circuit is going to have to extract and normalize the significant. It's not clear to me that returning P flag saves us any work in the future. If that's the case, then there is no point in expending resources. P flags has been useful for testing, but perhaps now that the circuit is complete, it's no longer needed. Keeping P flags might make sense if we stored floating point values not as a single 16, 32, 64, or 128-bit datum, but as a tuple of values with the size, the sign, the unbiased exponent, 
normalized significand and classification, that is the PFLAG's bit vector. Then, when invoking computation circuits such as the multiply circuit, the tuples for the operands would be passed into the circuit and the result would also be returned as a tuple. Doing this would save chip real estate and potentially improve performance. Simplify the conversion of data between various floating point formats and allow data checking of operands. For example, if the code loaded a binary 128 value into a register being used to do a 64-bit multiply, the circuit could signal a runtime error. For now, I'm going to leave the circuit as it is because I want to press on to other topics, but it's something we should be keeping in the back of our minds as a possible improvement to the code. The next detail is that if you look at the test bench for the multiply circuit, you'll see that I finally consolidated the four test benches for the different IEEE binary floating point formats into a single parameterized test bench. To simplify selecting valid IEEE exponent and significant field sizes, the test bench now uses a Verilog multi-branch if-def statement. To select a particular size, define one of the macro names binary 16, binary 32, binary 64, or binary 128. Whichever macro is defined will cause the appropriate NEXP and NSIG values to be set. If you should misspell the name of the desired macro, the else clause will cause a compilation error. Also, the old format specific test benches printed the type of the floating point data in the header. The header now also documents the rounding attribute which was used for the test run. The GitHub repository with the code for this video and the previous video about rounding subnormal numbers can be found in the comment section for this video. In the next video, I'll build the circuit which adds two floating point numbers. Please share this video with friends and colleagues who might have an interest in this video series. Questions and comments are welcome in the comments section. If you found this video useful, please click like below. While you're at it, subscribe to the channel, then click the bell to be notified when new videos are available. Thanks!